Did Utah prove that they are the team to beat in the Big 12 with their big time week one performance? And what are the early thoughts on Utah's matchup against Baylor? Vegas thinks Utah is going to win big. That's what we'll be discussing on today's Locked On Utes. You are Locked On Utes, your daily podcast on the Utah Utes. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, everyone, and thank you for making Locked On Utes your first listen every single day. We are available on all platforms, including YouTube and wherever you may get your podcast. If this is your first time listening to our show, make sure you like and subscribe. Love interacting with the, all of you in the YouTube comments or on social media. We can follow our show at Locked On Utes on X. Thank you for making Locked On Utes your first listen every single day. If you are in the market for a second listen, Locked On Big 12 is pretty good, I hear. More on that show in a moment. But first, want to talk with you all about our great friends at 5 hour energy five hour energy fixes tired fast with zero sugar and a convenient portable size it's the perfect pick me up for getting stuff done go to fivehourenergy.com and use promo code locked on cfb to receive 20 percent off your order this offer is only valid until september 30th on one order and cannot be used with other promotions you can go to fivehourenergy.com today. My name is JT Wistersill, former intern inside the University of Utah Athletic Department. Excited to have someone who got an opportunity to experience two game days in Utah at Locked On Big 12's Drake Toll joining me after going to not just Salt Lake City for Utah's matchup with the Thunderbirds, but also checking out BYU's game. Drake, how was your trip in Utah? Great, JT. Always love being out here. You know, Salt Lake is one of my favorite places to visit. Provo's great as well. Um, you know, I'm going to give you very honest opinions on both experiences, mm -hmm. and, and they're not uh, they're they're not biased because I get paid the same amount when every Big Twelve team wins. I want every Big Twelve team to have an elite atmosphere. I want the BYU Utah rivalry to be top notch because that drives numbers, drives eyeballs across the country. So I'll give you the full take. But before I do that, I just want to tell you Salt Lake spectacular, Res spectacular, Les spectacular. Those two things can be mutually exclusive if you go to a trip. If you go on a trip in Utah to watch football, you're going to be excited. Yes, I, I absolutely agree with you there. And I know you did have some comments that we can address in a moment. But no matter what you're going to say about your experience overall, there's one thing to your point about like how much you enjoyed your time in Utah and loving all of these teams is the question I posed in the open is Utah still the team to beat in the big 12. We both believe so you have them atop your latest power rankings that are available on the big 12's X handle that you run. And I have Utah still at the top as well too. Right. And I think the reason we still have Utah as a team to beat is they were the team to beat going into the season and they had a fantastic season opening performance, right? I mean, Cam Rising, a record for touchdowns and just a half for him. Brant Keithy looked more than back. The total yardage at halftime when all the starters were in for Utah, 339 for Utah, 85 for Southern Utah. Thunderbirds, not a great team by, or not even a, I mean, look, it's an FCS team, right? Like, so that's what they are. But Utah did what you're supposed to do against the team. Offense looked encouraging. Defense was dominant. I still think with all the strong performances we saw from big 12 teams, we'll get to those later in the show. Mm -hmm. I still think Utah looks like the best team in this conference as we record this today. Utah's number one. And, and as many people as I've had come after me for my thoughts in the Utah game, Utah's number one. Now, the reason that I have a critical eye of Utah is, is the same reason, JT, I have a critical eye of Kansas, of UCF, of, of certainly Texas Tech in what they did this week, because I hold Big 12 teams in these games to a unique standard. That standard is, I need you to blow somebody out and, and put yourself in adverse situations. And here's an example. Utah did that. They said, let's run the football. Let's, let's face third down. Let's face fourth down. Let's face tough offensive situations and from there, allow our elite coaching staff, again, that word is not hyperbolic, elite coaching staff, to cook. Two wheel routes, three Brant Keithy touchdowns. Those were the plays that Utah went to when they had to have them the first. Hey, on a third down, what do we do? Hey, we're pinned a bit. What do we do? There was always a play set up for the Utes to be successful. They knew we can break the coverage of SUU down, and they did that. So when I come on record, as I have on my podcast, as I have on Twitter, and say, Cam Rising did not show me an NFL or an elite-level throw, that's not a bad thing. Southern Utah never truly forced him into those moments. 
the couple of times where they got close, the couple times where I thought, hey, that was good defense from SUU. Cam Rising looked like a quarterback who's missed a year of football. That's not a bad thing. He's getting back into competition, hat on hat, with an opposing team rather than the team he's practicing with. I don't think Cam Rising's a bad quarterback. I think he can still be elite in the Big 12. He His five touchdown passes, four of them wide open, one of them, Brant Keithy, doing what Brant Keithy does. He is the best tight end of the country, one of the best pass catchers in the country. Rising didn't have the opportunities to be a star, didn't have the opportunities to impress, and that's why I'm still holding out at least on him, play calling elite, Brant Keithy elite, run game solid, holding out on Rising until they play Baylor. I will agree with a couple of things you said. Some I'll push back. I think one thing that is absolutely true. I don't think a single throw in this game is one of the best throws that Cam Rising has made during his time at Utah. And I also love that you brought up like Drake. This is something I brought up a lot on this show. Tom Brady before yesterday had played a snap more recently than Cam Rising. So there was that time where he's got to acclimate himself and get back in. The one thing I will push back on, and I'm curious if you will, you'll keep this from what your show, because I think you said your friend was the one who said this. Are you sticking by one read city for one read? He didn't have to go anywhere else. That's there, were, there was okay. there was no pressure on him. One, no pressure. The Utah right. offensive line was great. No, they I were not. What, what are you? The very first play of the game, he nearly gets sacked. Spencer Fano, mm. the right tackle, gets beat inside. He gets mm. hit. Cam Rising from the only their late third, late second quarter breakdowns. Other than that, Cam Rising pocket time wide open, and the times that he did roll out, he was good. That's my favorite note in there was. Good on out route. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I had a buddy of mine who's a big college football guy out of Las Vegas, actually, who said one read city. Rising typically was like, hey, this guy's open because they were open the whole game. But I they weren't Utah's- always the first, they weren't the first read always. Mm, I mm, well, number one from if you want, sitting okay. in my seat in section W07, I saw him look at the Excuse one me. receiver and stare at the one guy who was wide open who was the first read and go, I'm gonna throw you the ball. And it worked. Well, no- well, first of all, I think if they are if for what you are specifically. So here's the one read ones, right? First of all, it's impressive pre-snap, right? Recognizing, hey, Dejon Stanley and the way they are lined up. I'm yeah. going to make this throw here like that. I'm not penalizing him for that. Uh, Brant Keithy's touchdown down the seam. That one is the last touchdown to Brant Keithy. He's the second read. Dorian Singer's the first read in the end zone because he's in the end zone. So he's looking in the same direction for that. Then he comes back to Brant by the time his route is open. So that one's the second read. If you look through these ones as well, you find a bunch of them. The first down to Money Parks, he threw the ball a little behind him. That wasn't the first read either. Mm-hmm. There are several examples throughout the game where else he goes through his progressions. I understand what you're saying with Dejon Stanley. Was the Money that, Parks one not the first read? Because that's one that I remember vividly first. that I didn't like. He's not the first. The one that mm-hmm. that goes for a first down? It does go for the one behind him. He he kind of yes. puts him in a tough no, He wasn't yeah. the first. No, he, his yeah. eyes don't yeah. go there first. That's not where Cam's eyes go first when you when you watch it back. Because I know you saw it there. I just rewatched mm-hmm. the game back. That's why I'm going back on this and was able to rewind it and watch his eyes more. Because I get what you're saying that a lot of times the ball got out of his hand quick like that. But a lot of the guys were also in the deep pass to Dorian Singer over the middle of the field. Money Parks is behind him as well. So Mm -hmm. he he does he's looking at money as well, too. He's just then moving off of there should, as well. Should so, say too, I, I I will throw this out. One read city was not uh was not one of the negatives I had for Buell because of, for Utah. I thought that the offensive play calling was spectacular. I thought the hot routes that Cam had all night were meant to be open and they were open. So that wasn't a problem for me. I was very impressed with how Utah called the game, especially the scripted drives on mm-hmm. the money. They were, and I think that was something where there were questions about Utah's offense because if you look at the numbers, they averaged 23 points per game last year. But I think what people don't understand is this is so different because it's a Kyle Whittingham team. Kyle Whittingham did not trust the quarterbacks he had, so Andy Ludwig, in a way, had his hands tied behind his back and was not able to run everything he wants to with this yeah. offense. They had Nate Johnson at quarterback in games. What did Nate Johnson do best? He, Yeah, you're not wrong with that. Not much. Oh, and, he, not much. And, he, yeah, and he's best at running the ball, but yeah. Nate kept fumbling it, so yeah. Utah was consent saying, hey, I know we're down by a touchdown, but as long as this game's within reach, I don't want to risk a turnover here. So I'm glad that Andy Ludwig got a chance to show off his stuff. We had talked a lot about the offense. I will say really quickly, you, you tweeted out that Brant Keithy is king. What was most impressive about watching him go off in person? He, is, he can not only create with the ball, but create without the ball. When in doubt, mm-hmm. he is a Travis Kelsey type. He is. That is a. Yeah. I think it's a perfect collegiate 
um, a example for what Brant Keith is going to give Utah this year. It is, hey, I, I just I need a break. I need an escape. I need somebody who's open downfield somewhere. Brant Keith is that guy. Not only will he be open, he's going to catch the ball and create. And then real quick, I want a defensive take from you. I thought Utah's front defensive line in particular, I know it's Southern Utah, but just with how many returners they have back, I thought they looked particularly disruptive. What was your biggest takeaway from Utah's defense? Good. Elite. I, I, I think... What you can ask of you, and I've talked to Spencer McLaughlin, who's the voice of SUU pregame. Yes, he said this is the best team we've had in a while, uh, the best offense we've had in a while. If that, if that's the best SUU offense they've had in a while, and Utah did that to them, it just speaks volumes about Utah's defense. It does as well. And Southern Utah's quarterback, and look, maybe this will be end up being the Thunderbirds' best offense. It's tough to make your first ever start in Rice Eccles Stadium. Good luck. <laughs> that yeah, was a uh, that was a that was a tough go of things there too. So Utah's first game's in the books. Now we turn our attention to Baylor in week two. Baylor got it done against Tarleton. What kind of a threat are they against Utah? That's what we are going to be diving into and discussing in one moment. But first, want to take an opportunity to tell you all about one of the sponsors of today's episode of Locked On Utes. It's our friends at Five Hour Energy. Guys, I don't know about you, but as much as I was loving the college football action this weekend, on top of the other things I had on my to-do list, I got tired. And what I could turn to when I hit that wall was five hour energy. It's there for me before when I want to get a workout in or when I'm just trying to keep, stay up watching the sport I love so much, just like you, college football. And what I love about five hour energy is they have zero sugar and a convenient portable size. It's the perfect pick me up for getting stuff done. The five hour energy website has flavor galore like watermelon, tropical burst, grape, berry, and more. There is a flavor for everyone. You can try them all on the site. You even have the option to build your own 12 pack or 24 pack. You choose the flavors and it's delivered right to your door. If you go to fivehourenergy.com, that's the number five, not spelled out, the number five hourenergy.com and get some five hour energy product today. You can use my promo code locked on CFB, all caps, no spaces, locked on CFB to receive 20% off your order. This offer is only valid until September 30th on one order and cannot be used with other promotions. The code is not good on subscriptions orders. You can go to fivehourenergy.com today. Drake Toll back with me here. And before we do talk about the Baylor thing, I want to remind you all that we have something really fun that we do each week on Locked On College, Locked On Utes, and just throughout all our Big 12 channels during the season is we all come together during the week and do one massive show together. Drake is the challenge of hosting that and trying to make sure everyone uh, talks equally, which I do not envy, but always a lot of fun. It'll drop on Thursdays, and we will run it down on everything going on in the Big 12 conference. And we'll get to everything that was going on in the Big 12 shortly, Drake. But we did see Baylor in action this weekend against Tarleton for the first time and look they they beat the crap out of Tarleton right I mean it was 45 to 3 but still some things were like okay in the first half if we're comparing it to what Utah did yes they're up 28 to nothing they'd have two three and outs and an interception defense looked good but it's also and I haven't even begun to break down the film yet I'm still going on a lot of the preseason stuff because just like with Utah we feel so confident or at least I do because I've seen these players for Utah do it at a high level there's a reason Dave Aranda's on the hot seat, and there's a reason there are new pieces in, like a Daquan Finn, because things didn't go Baylor's way yet. So I still think they have some questions. We'll get to those in a moment. But what's your temper, temperature check on this Baylor team after week one? Yeah, so far with the Baylor Bears, I think the first thing I've got to say is if the question is, is, is Baylor – in a spot to upset Utah, the answer is unequivocally no. There is, there is, and and truly, as someone who went to Baylor, who now, if there's a single Big 12 team that I, I would like to see win a national championship, it's the school I gave four years to, obviously. Baylor is not up to par with a, a squad like Utah. And neither school really had to give it 100% last week. Each team got to use the playbook as they wanted, use half of it. 60% of it, Richard Reese of Baylor said that was the case for the Bears. And Jake Spavitol, great opener as the offensive coordinator. I like the play calling for Baylor. Dave Aranda calling the defense, really solid. Liked his postgame comments saying that I, he said he got mad. They forced they forced three, they allowed three points. They forced Tarleton into a blender. He said, I got mad because I just don't like giving anything up. Those are good signs for Baylor. Daquan Finn reminded me a bit of, K.J. Jefferson, so many people are ragging on K.J. Jefferson from UCF this week because he had the preseason hype. Daquan Finn didn't. 
both those quarterbacks were quite comparable. Great legs. The arm was not at all times elite. One of the quotes that I saw used was a pea shooter. Dequan Finn is a pea shooter. However, the offensive line of Baylor wasn't up to par what I wanted it to be against an FCS opponent, and Dequan Finn wasn't completely consistent. So there, there's the good and the bad. I open with very impressed with what Baylor gave you based on how they played last season, going 3-9, and nine, losing to Texas State. But also, there are still plenty of holes for the Bears where I think Utah is just going to outmatch Dave Aranda's squad and win by a whole lot more than they did in Waco last year. Vegas says them favored by 17 right now, which is yep. that's a large line. We'll see if Utah can can match that because I do have some concerns still about this Utah team for that. I still I feel strong about them and I, I do think they'll beat Baylor, but there are still it wasn't like it was a flawless performance from what are Baylor, you, even what I did, are you concerned about? What about Utah? Are you concerned because again the offensive line? I, the offensive some line harsh. Line. I had some harsh takes about Utah, but I don't know if I'd say I'm concerned about any. I, I still thought the O-line looked fine. What are you concerned about? If the offensive line does not play better than they did last week, Utah will not win at Oklahoma State. I believe that firmly. I think that yeah, it was now. Yeah, I expect I, them. Yeah. I still I, think I Utah think... is going to lose at Oklahoma State, but that's not a bad thing. That's I mean, you're yeah. still you're <laughs> exactly. playing 2 11-1. Exactly. I mean, Utah is going to yeah. win double-digit games mm-hmm. in the regular season, no doubt. you got to lose somewhere, probably. I mean, that's not a bad thing. You think yeah. the offensive line just wasn't up to par. Yeah, I just don't. I think there's still some moving pieces there. And, you know, Caleb Lomu, first ever start. Spencer Fano settling back in on the right side. And I trust those players to improve each week. And I even think, especially like, you know, first game under your belt of the season, I think there's even an improvement after that. We talked about that with Cam Rising a little bit. Yes, I disagree with some of the things on that we've pushed back on, but there are opportunities I look at in the game with, hey, that ball to Money Parks was behind him. I wish that was out in front of him. Mm-hmm. Hey, you scrambled too early here. If you actually look back over here, this, this guy is open in that spot too. I'm not concerned about Cam. But there are just still things with the offensive line I want to see come together. There are already a couple injuries this team had that start to pile up, too. So that's where I'm hoping that uh, Utah will be able to stay healthy. But focusing back in on Baylor, I I do agree with you. I think Utah's in a good spot against the Bears because, look, Daquan Quinn, Daquan, excuse me, Daquan Quinn is very talented. But, you know, that I didn't see the second interception yet. I know the first one's not great. The defender is right in front of him there. So it's just plays like that, that those can really come back to bite you when you're already coming in as a big underdown. Now, he's a talented player, Mac player of the year from Toledo, 2,600 yards, 22 touchdowns. I like this wide receiver core, but there's not really a star, I would say, at least yet, that has emerged as, like compared to some of the best receivers in this conference for my money. Uh, running backs and O-line, probably below average in the Big 12. You even mentioned being underwhelmed by that offensive line. Uh, D-line is fine, but I, they're not great at rushing the quarterback. Solid linebackers. Secondary was not great last year, but should be a little better. That was a lot of my preseason thoughts coming in. And after looking over kind of the statistics from that first game and watching a couple of the key plays, I, I feel like those still stand, especially as we mentioned, it's just really hard to win inside Salt Lake City too. Yeah. And if you look at the Twitter feed for both teams, if, mm-hmm. if you're the guy that goes and says, oh, look, touchdown. Oh, cool. This is a nice touchdown. Those are not going to tell the story of what these two schools did on Saturday because it was so comparable from the highlight stand. We watch the highlight package, you go, oh, fun, big passing touchdown. Oh, wow, how cool. Cam Rising is back. You know, Bad Moon Rising plays. And oh, wow, Daquan Finn can run for Baylor. Yeah, those things are true, but one of these rosters is still vastly better than the other and vastly better than the 20 to 13 score that Utah gave last year in Waco. And maybe my big thing, and Travis Roeder, one of the best Baylor Bear insiders there is, uh, R is boy, my journalism degree is lacking me there. That guy says that he hasn't found one true playmaker, one creator at least, at running back for Baylor. And that's probably the case between the the trio of guys that they've got running the ball in the backfield. And for Utah, maybe that's my my biggest question at this point going against Baylor is if the Bears shut down the run, which as you you had decent success against the run in the first half, and Cam Rising said, "Look, ha, I'm Cam Rising. I'll bail us out." Um, and, and maybe bailout's the wrong word. It was just wheel route, Brant Keithy, bam. You can do the same thing against Baylor. You can't do that against Oklahoma State. My question is, if Baylor does end up stopping the run, is Utah going to be able to bail themselves out to the tune of winning by 17 points at least? I do have questions. I have questions about that too. I just do feel yeah. like there's some things still coming together on this team that I, I expect Utah to win. But if this was the 17 is a lot. I mean, if this game's yeah, within 40, yeah, I do think well, Utah will win. But right now, I feel confident that Utah will win by. I'll still. I'll say over ten right now. Yeah, too. look. But yeah, Utah's up thirty-one ten. Baylor gets a trash sure. touchdown. You know, garbage time touchdown and thirty-one seventeen is your final. You don't cover. You still dominated. You know. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, and even there, I wouldn't be surprised if this game was within a touchdown at halftime still. I think yeah. all it takes is that one drive putting together. There is still this process up. This is a step up in a defense, right? So you mentioned the receivers, Cam Rising. I'm really high on this group. I think they're ready for it, but when they are tested to that level, that'll be a fun task. And I, I'm excited to see if this Utah team is uh, is up to par with it too. And one thing that's really exciting, Drake, is because we spent a lot, of, a lot of this time all offseason talking about week one. Well, week one is finally in the book. So we are going to get an opportunity to, opportunity to talk about our biggest takeaways from the first week of action in one moment but first want to take a moment and talk with you all about one of the sponsors of today's episode of locked on utes it's our friends at ultimate college football head coach hey locked on utes fans i want to take a moment to give you a heads up on a brand new mobile game that i think you are going to love as much as i do ultimate college football head coach. In this amazing game and simulation, you get to step into the shoes of a head coach and lead your college football program to glory. Can you imagine actually being the head coach of the Utah Utes? That's what you have the opportunity to do with Ultimate College Football Head Coach. From recruiting players and hiring coaching staffs to overseeing training camps and handling school scholarships, you control every crucial detail of your program. It's all in your hands. And will you be able to handle the pressure? That's what you can get to work on now. And here's what I really love about the game. You are responsible for calling the offensive plays. Your strategy will not only determine the success of your football team, but will shape the future and legacy of your program. Ultimate College Football Head Coach is completely free, has no ads, and is 100% playable offline. You can play on the go as you want and when you want to. And, of course, we have a special offer on Locked On Utes. For all of you Locked On Utes fans, you can use the promo code Locked On CFB, all caps, no spaces, once again, to go inside the game store and receive a free boost to start your program. Make sure to take advantage of this perk as it will give your team off to a strong start. To download the game, just visit ultimate-cfb.com, ultimate-cfb.com, or look it up on the App Store to use that code Locked On CFB to start beginning your coaching legacy with Ultimate College Football Head Coach today. All right, Drake Toll, week one of Big 12 action is in the books. As someone who does cover this conference in totality, what were your biggest takeaways? Good. Oh, my gosh, we were good. I love it. Yeah. And look, some of you sucked. I can't, you can't sugarcoat it. Houston UNLV really stunk. Yeah. There's The crowd's not great. You get beat 27 to 7. Your your doors are blown off. And Donovan Smith didn't look very good. And then I turn over to West Virginia and Penn State and go, this? This, after the couple bright spots offensively that I got from West Virginia early, they say, you know what? We're good. We're going to kind of bow out on this one. And and it was sloppy. They looked underprepared, unprepared, based on where Neil Brown had his team. A fumble here, fumble there, play calling, felt lackadaisical. Go for it on fourth down and just couldn't push anything through. And then the most disappointing team in the Big 12 this weekend, the Texas Tech Red Raiders. And there's mm-hmm. not a see What I love about it, there, and uh, I, I know I said good. I'm starting with the bad. I, there is not a single Texas Tech fan that I've had in the comments section or on Twitter anywhere is going, oh, come on, man, it's week one. Give us a chance. Nope. They all agree that stunk really, really hard beating a- Abilene I keep wanting to say Arizona Christian. Abilene Christian, because of that, they're that irrelevant. Abilene Christian, 52-51, to 51, a missed two-point conversion in overtime that made the difference against an FCS school that's not as good as Wyoming or Southern Illinois or even Tarleton State or certainly as SUU. That's bad. Now, the rest of us not only took care of business, but some teams look doubly impressive doing it. Oklahoma State, TCU going on the road against Stanford and winning the game. That's all I can ask. Just go win the game. Some teams didn't do that. Arizona and Tep. Offense elite. Iowa State's defense. Baylor impressed more than I expected them to. BYU, whether you want to hear it or not, 41-13 was stunning. I had SIU covering all day long in this game, and they dominated, and Jake Rutzlaff looked good. Then Arizona State beats the brakes off of Wyoming, and Utah takes care of Southern Utah, and Kansas beats the brakes off Lindenwood, and UCF wins 57-3, to and even Colorado beats North Dakota State. That's a good weekend for the Big 12. I saw a different Big 12 uh, 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 media pundit post, you know, the Big 12's big missed opportunity. We go, I don't give a crap. There were no missed opportunities. I love that the conference goes 14-2 and two and gets 14 pretty confident wins. Wait, okay, are you sh- no missed opportunity even though the Penn State loss? I don't even care at this point. 
Okay. I, I freaking <laughs> I love I, it. Just, oh, it irks the crap out of me because I love West Virginia. I love their I makeup. Do. And the second I trust Neil Brown, he says, uh, sorry, here's a fumble and another one and an offsides and a false start. And I just, I really love West Virginia, man. And they were so disappointing. Yeah. And the game was funky. And James Franklin was more prepared. And at this point, there are nine other contenders that until West Virginia proves, once again, we can contend, nine other contenders to look at and be proud of. That's fair. The only thing I will say about West Virginia is it's actually more so about Penn State. That team's really only lost to Ohio State and Michigan the last few years. Like, I just think at the end of the season, that will not be – a bad loss, even though that yes, it still sucks to lose at home. I just think Penn State's a really good yeah, program. I mean, you lost to ten and two Penn State. <laughs> That's that. Yeah. Yeah, I know. <laughs> uh last thing before we get out of here, we got the time. And I know people are just gonna be mad at me if I don't ask you about it. But Rice Eccles Stadium versus you know what I'm gonna say, Lavelle Edwards Stadium. Give me your thoughts on the atmosphere and experience and explain some of the tweets and comments that have our uh good old Utah fans a little fired up. Utah fans, I don't hate you. I don't like BYU more than Utah. I get paid equally to like all 16 teams. Rice Eccles Stadium on Thursday was far worse than where I've seen BYU and Lavelle Edwards Stadium against Baylor, against a top 15 team, and against Cincinnati last year in a Friday night funky conference game, which the atmosphere was great. That is not an indictment in totality on Rice Eccles Stadium. That's an indictment on Thursday night. I come from a school in Baylor that when when Baylor's top 15, that's a little rare. Utah at this point has seen it, but brother, right. you've got a chance to win the Big 12. Show up for your school, be there when the ball kicks off, and yell a little bit. That's what I'm asking. BYU is going to bring it every game. There are intricacies for the reason why, and part of that is the absolute love from many of the LDS members for what BYU is. Saturday is their chance to let loose, go crazy, and represent an entire faith on that scale with an institution that is the flagship of that faith. For Utah, it's a, a mixture, a fan base that comes together with a mixture of people from this state who care so deeply. And on Thursday night, I didn't get that. Now, look, does that mean on Saturday against Baylor that Utah is going to have a bad atmosphere? No. I can guarantee you it'll be spectacular. But, but, and I don't think you can disagree with this. Utah, from a facility standpoint, is still operating with what feels like more of a mid-level, low-level Pac-12 stadium or a high-level Mountain West stadium. Give me a, give me an upper bowl. Give me an opportunity to hear, but like the sound escapes straight up. Give me an opportunity for Utah fans who are an elite fan base, who have an elite stadium to showcase that they are that. I know you are. I know there are very 90% of Utah fans are normal and cool and good. Give your fan base an opportunity to showcase that. And during a big game against Baylor, I guarantee you they do it. I think I agree with, I do agree with almost everything you said. I think the only thing I'll say is like more so your thoughts on it not being allowed, like because of the stadium construction, things of that nature. When it's a big game, I don't think that would be your same concern. I think it Hope would so. be incredibly yeah. loud. Just like, Flo I mean, ask Graham Mertz last year. I don't, yeah. I know, I, I mean, Graham, Graham Mertz is going through it right now. So maybe don't ask him right now about it. Maybe ask him about that. He up. has other I'm issues. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. But um, this, you, the look, what everything you have talked about is relating to Thursday night versus Saturday night. Yeah. Number one, yeah. also what you mentioned, B, they, BYU had more fans in the stands and you were there i, I always will there. you know like uh, that's because it's one stadium capacity. bigger yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Because of the capacity and i've i've been i wasn't there thursday but i've been to enough utah games to know this they say the sellout and you're kind of looking around at the start like this is not a sellout and that's because people do show up late and they begin to pack in especially when what once again what's the feeling it's like oh we've been a top 15 this is an fcs right. opponent that that sentiment absolutely existed versus Look, this is a BYU team that's going to be fighting to get bowl eligible. That's a reality yep. of the situation. So every win in every game is even more important. If, if yep. Utah, like bowl eligibility isn't even a question for, for what's on the table for them this yep. year too. So I, I have no doubt in my mind that BYU was of the two, the better atmosphere because of the opponent, because of what that win, the first one will mean like that too. And I expect that, the, especially the game against like the Baylor one, because this is the first Saturday, the Arizona game that'll be coming up soon. That's when it'll really be rocking. But I know a lot of people had gave you crap for your statements, but I, I agree. I, I feel like what you said has been completely justified.
And Utah, don't use it as an excuse. When Auburn plays an FCS school in the opening game, they get up. Arkansas, the same way. They're SEC. Become an SEC-like atmosphere, no matter the opponent, no matter the game. College football is back. Get your butt in your seat when when the ball kicks off. Hey, Kyle Whittingham will be playing that clip in front of the team. Maybe that and a few other things you said about Utah in the past, right? (laughs) Maybe. (laughs) Sorry, guys. Oh, Drake, you're the best. Always appreciate you taking the time. Uh, Tell everyone what they can expect on Locked On Big 12 this week. Yeah, you got the uh, power rankings coming out this week. It's a Monday episode. Tuesday, we're talking all things Utah Utes. Wednesday, the rest of the week, recap uh, both last week and preview this weekend at LO Big 12 on Twitter and Locked on Big 12, wherever you find your podcast plus YouTube. Appreciate you taking the time to check out Utah, both for Utah and BYU's perspective, and always stopping by with me, Drake. Thank you again. That is going to do it for today's edition of Locked on Utes and Locked on Big 12 as well. Appreciate all of you for stopping by, and we'll be back with you soon talking more about the conference we all hold near and dear to our hearts.